I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Joel Greenblatt, legendary value investor, founder of Gotham Capital, longtime teacher at Columbia Business School, and author of four investment books, the latest of which, Common Sense, The Investor's Guide to Equality, Opportunity, and Growth, recently hit the book stands. Our conversation takes a tour through Joel's career. We cover his background, early success running a concentrated portfolio, closing the fund to manage his own money, and reopening with a more diversified approach. We discuss Joel's timeless investment beliefs, and along the way, also discuss the Value Investors Club, seating managers, and applying investment lessons to education. Today's show is sponsored by Canalyst, the leading destination for public company data and models. In my brief time as a buy-side analyst a while back, the software available at best delivered simplistic financials with bad data. Canalyst's platform has exactly what you would want as an analyst. Detailed company-specific models on over 4,000 equities with clean data, appropriate adjustments, and relevant KPIs for each company informed by their small army of analysts. If you're not already a user, I strongly suggest you give Canalyst a try at canalyst.com slash TED. That's Canalyst with a C. Today's show is sponsored by iConnections. iConnections software platform seamlessly connects managers and allocators for virtual meetings, giving managers the ability to subscribe and share information with allocators who can efficiently select and meet managers all on one platform. The scalable technology powering iConnections can be used for bespoke events by managers, allocators, and service providers. Visit iConnections.io to learn more. Today's show is sponsored by Backstop Solutions, a leading investment management and multi-asset class research suite that helps institutional investors operate more efficiently. Recently, Backstop did a third-party study of how allocators are spending their time and how to make better use of it. Request your copy of the report by contacting the Backstop Solutions team today at BackstopSolutions.com. Please enjoy my conversation with Joel Greenblatt. Joel, thanks so much for doing this. Oh, my pleasure. Happy to be here. I would love to go all the way back like all the way back to how you first got interested in investing? Oh, that's a good question. I was always interested in business. My father was a shoe manufacturer. And so I guess we talk about business at the dinner table. And so I ended up going to Wharton, but I didn't really know anything about the stock market. And I was actually taking the law boards. I remember this quite well. And I read an article in Forbes about Ben Graham, who had a stock picking formula for beating the market. And I had only been learning about efficient markets and that it's a waste of time beating the market. It didn't make any sense to me. We were learning how to graph portfolios in three-dimensional space and a lot of other fun stuff. But the basic idea was that you can't beat the market, so don't even try. That's what we were learning in school. And I read the paper every day, so it was very clear to me. Stock prices were pretty wild all the time. I don't know how much more I put together, but when I read the Ben Graham article from Forbes, just a light bulb went off and I said, oh, this makes total sense to me. You're just systematically buying things that are being sold to you at low prices. That sounds like it makes sense and that people are emotional and sometimes you get bargains. And so once I read that article, really, I remember it truly a a stroke of lightning went off and I said, oh, this makes total sense. I started reading everything. Benjamin Graham eventually led me to Buffett and that's really how I, I learned how to invest. So what do you do with that? You read an article, you read more about Buffett, you're coming out of school. How'd you get started? I stayed to go to graduate business school. There was this program you could get your MBA in another year. So I did that and I corralled a couple of my business school friends. One is Rich Bazzina, who's a well-known money manager, and others Bruce Newberg, who 
as one of my smartest friends, and I said, hey, we should really research this. And of course, there were really no great databases and computers were sort of just getting started. I grew up on Lost in Space with the robot. I don't know if anyone remembers that, but it wasn't very sophisticated. So the computer Wharton had at the time was about four classrooms big. It didn't do very much and it needed punch cards. And of course, we didn't have databases. So we actually found the Standard Poor's Stock Guides at the time had a little date on 5,000 different companies. And we actually manually went through them. And I said, we got to test this. And we all tested together. And our study ended up getting written up in the Journal of Portfolio Management. And it was really a study of that first article I read with Ben Graham about buying stock selling below liquidation value and actually went out and raised money from a bunch of my father's friends, not a lot of money. I still didn't keep me from going to law school, unfortunately. I dropped out after a year, so that was the good news. But during that year of law school, I was running this small fund and really was smitten with stock investing. How small was small back then? Well, I guess my father had good friends, and this was back in the late 70s, so it was about $250,000, which was real money at that time. And so they were very nice to trust me, and I went and bought a lot of net nets, or what Buffett would call cigar butts, and it worked out really well. How did you progress forward into it being more of a professional business? I was out in California really by myself out at Stanford for a year. I figured I got in. I should go. It can't hurt me. But pretty soon after I got to law school, I said, hey, listen, I never wanted to be a lawyer. I just didn't want to get one of those hundred hour a week Wall Street jobs out of MBA school. That did look appealing. And I figured I like school. So I went I went out there and realized, you know, if you don't want to be a lawyer, this is really a dumb thing to do. And so when everyone else was looking for summer jobs, I went looking for a summer job on Wall Street instead of at a law firm and uh, found one at Bear Stearns Trading Options. And after summer doing that, which was very handy, and, and trading options at Bear Stearns at that time was pretty cool because it was pretty archaic where I could run across the trading floor to get a computer printout, run back to my desk, call in and, and do arbitrage, <laughs> you know, <laughs> options versus stocks. And so it was a great way to learn about that and all the cool things you could do with options. But I certainly didn't want to do that for a living, but I knew I wasn't going back to law school. And I ended up through a friend of mine who had just taken a job on Wall Street. One of the people he had talked to was leaving a firm called Ella Rothschild at the time, setting up his own firm. His name was Alan Slifka. And that looked appealing to me. I'm more entrepreneurial. And so it was a startup. And there were three partners and an analyst. And that was me. So I was the guy doing the work and was doing more or less risk arbitrage at the time because... I mean, a pedestrian year back then was you made 60 or 100% doing risk arbitrage, and that seemed like better than making 20% by net nets and also something interesting to learn. And I didn't know much about it, but I said, I'm going to learn a lot. And I took a job at, I think I got paid $22,000, which was well less than half of what my MBA colleagues had gotten the year before, before I went off to law school. But I just figured the education would have been priceless. And I, I took that job and I never went back to law school. My mother's a Jewish mom, and you were either a doctor or a lawyer at that time. And I think her head was in the oven. And I said, yeah, I got to try this. And I, I went and did that, thank God. And I really have enjoyed it ever since. So what was the progression from taking that job as a risk arb analyst to striking out on your own? Well, the big picture is risk arbitrage went against everything that I had was in my bones that I really was attracted to with Ben Graham, which is buy with a large margin of safety, don't lose a lot and try to make a lot and risk arbitrage, betting on whether a deal's going to go through. And if it breaks, you lose $15. If it goes through, you make a dollar or 75 cents, but you made it in two months. So it was a great annualized return. So lose $15, make a dollar. Seemed like sort of the opposite of the risk reward that was in my bones felt right to me. And so I pretty quickly gravitated toward looking at weird deals where that wasn't the risk reward either. There were some interesting pieces of paper being offered instead of just cash. And there were weird securities being offered, or I gravitated towards recapitalizations and spinoffs, anything that could get me out of the risk arbitrage business, even though it was lucrative at the time. I just gravitated towards looking at things that were a little off the beaten path. And I just loved the complication and the strangeness. And just to talk about how far that was, even in risk arbitrage, you made money by running to the SEC faster than the other guy and reading a little faster. So that just tells you how things have changed. But that was kind of fun at the time, just being able to find those things. But 
I gravitated away from the risk arbitrage business myself. Luckily, they let me manage my own account at that time. And even though it wasn't a lot of money, if you can do these off the beat bad things and make hundreds of percent a year, it can grow pretty fast. And I thought there were attractive opportunities. And three years into it, one day I called my friend who was working for Mike Milken. And I said to him, gee, if I could raise X dollars, I'd go out on my own and run a fund. And he called me back the next day and said, Mike said, fine. So what was X dollars back then? X dollars, I think, was about $5 million that if I could raise $5 million, I'd go out on my own. But it wasn't as easy as I made it sound. I had to fly out to the West Coast and talk to Mike Milken. And I had an idea of what I wanted to get paid for managing the money. And I thought it was very generous. And I'm not a very good negotiator. And Milken was negotiating 20 deals a day. But I actually kept him there for an hour negotiating my deal because I'm not a good negotiator, but it was my life. And I had, he had 20 deals that day and I had a bottom line. So I kept him there for an hour and I actually literally had Ron Perlman waiting in the next room to do the Revlon deal. And I kept him waiting there and he finally gave up on me and walked out, sent his brother in. And I got the deal from his brother. And then Mike hit the roof later, but it was too late. And he ended up offering me twice what I asked. And I, I took half of it because I wanted to make sure I could run it and do a good job. And so it all worked out from there. So that auspicious beginning, you started on this, let's call it your first iteration of investing for the next decade. And, you know, it was a sort of a storied career and you wrote about it in your first book. I'm curious how you thought about portfolio construction in the context of finding all of these interesting special sets and spinoffs and whatnot. Well, the big picture, our portfolio six to eight ideas were traditionally 80 plus percent of our portfolio. If you're really looking for unfair bets, there aren't that many they throw at you. You can only look at so many. Maybe you have to go through 70 or 100. You found six or eight ridiculous unfair bets. I didn't want to get paid for taking risk. I wanted to get paid for because I did a little more work or I found something off the beaten path. And so by definition, there aren't that many of them. But if you're talking about sizing, and I thought nothing, we made 50 percent a year for those 10 years before our fees. And people ask how you did that. And I said, well, we, we stayed small. We, after five years, we returned half our capital. We were concentrated. So six to eight ideas were 80% of our portfolio. And you have to get a little lucky. And what I mean by getting a little lucky is sometimes we'd have a position that would start at 20 or 30% of the portfolio and maybe grow from there. So it, they got pretty large. And I think the key to sizing them, if you want to know my portfolio management philosophy, is look down, not up. Meaning, the largest positions were not the ones I thought were absolutely the best or that I was going to make the most money. It, sizing all had to do with how much money could you lose. If you couldn't lose much money, you can take a very big position. And what I mean by losing money is, is that if you could wait it out and not leverage, I didn't really use leverage. If you could wait for a year or two to get out of the portfolio, how much would you lose? How Out of that position, how much would you lose? And if I couldn't see how to think of buying a pile of $10 that didn't do anything, and if you paid $7, it could trade at five. But if you gave it time, you were gonna get your money back. And so you can take a very large position, especially if attached to that pile of cash was a really good business. So it had some upside to it. And so that would be an ideal position, not the one I thought I was making 10 times my money, but the ones I didn't think I was going to lose much money. You can buy a lot of those because it's not how much assets you put in it or what percentage of your portfolio is it. It's how much are you risking of your assets. So in the strategy that you later wrote up and became part of for a long time, a typical hedge fund playbook, if you will, what was it like fishing around in places where you weren't part of the crowd? I opened You Can Be a Stock Market Genius with a story about my in-laws, about how they spent their weekends up in Connecticut looking at tag sales and country auctions and yard sales. And when they found a painting that they liked, they didn't ask, is this painter going to be the next Picasso? Their question was, are there similar paintings by this artist that have just gone up for auction or sold the dealers for two or three times what I can buy it for here? totally different skill sets. So I wasn't really taking guesses. I felt like I was cheating. Like, all right, well, if you had done this work or look at this little corner, you would buy it too. It's just that I read page 227 of the prospectus or 
this is a small cap thing that other people aren't looking at, or this is so complicated. If I take the time to analyze this ahead of most other people, eventually people will get there. But I know I'm only competing with a couple other people who are even willing to do this work or look in this place. And so it always felt like, I wouldn't say cheating, but I always knew it when I had it, that it wasn't like I was a great analyst or anything. It was that any idiot who looked at this would see that this is selling 50 cents on the dollar, and I just happen to know where to look. Over that decade, did you have any positions that really went awry in terms of downside more than you expected? Yeah, well, there are a couple of times that things didn't go well for us. And when I got started, and this is uh, 86, I started in 85, so this is towards the end of 86, there was a problem on Wall Street with Ivan Bosky and Mike Milken. And Milken was financing a lot of the merger deals at the time. And so I had in my portfolio five or six merger deals that were going on, whether I had a piece of a security or I had some iteration of it. And I thought that was diversity in my portfolio, but it turned out it was all the same bet. You know, is the financing going to go through or is it not going to go through? And at that time, I literally had six deals. It wasn't my whole portfolio, but I had six deals that broke at the same time, which I thought were independent bets. And so lost a lot of money. Luckily, I had been up that year. I think I was up 80%. I finished up 30. So I guess you could say I was playing with house money, but that's a big drop and painful. And the great thing about that was that, remember I said, get a little lucky. So I got a little lucky there. In 87, before the crash, things didn't smell very well to me. And I liquidated a big chunk of my portfolio before. That's the only good market call I think I've ever had in my career. So I think you can be successful without knowing which way the market's going. But in that particular case, I got kind of cold feet. And I think the lesson I learned from 86 when that happened was that there's a lot of correlations that you don't think are in your portfolio. So I was very careful to examine my risk. And I think that really helped me. And the same thing happened to me again, where we were up about 80%. And I think we finished up 30% for the year. And I think that was a great performance given the stock market crashed pretty precipitously. And I think my experience from the previous year helped me. I was more conservative than I would have been in that environment. I still ended up up in a year where the market during a period really got crushed. And a lot of people who were doing what I do got in a lot of trouble. And that was a great lesson to learn. And I said, you know what? In 88, I was super conservative. I think we were up 60 something percent that year. If I were going crazy, I probably would have made 200% that year. But my conclusion was, if I can be super conservative, and make 60 something percent, it's crazy to do anything else. And so I always assumed what will happen to me if the world comes to an end while I own this portfolio? Am I still okay? And that was just a great mantra to carry with me through that period of time. So certainly had some ups and downs. And frankly, I returned all our outside capital after 10 years since we averaged such a good return 50% a year before our fees for the 10 years. It wasn't because my partners were giving me a hard time or it wasn't because things didn't work out all right. But when you run such a concentrated portfolio, every couple of years, there are a few days where you lose 20 or 30% of your assets because one or two of your ideas aren't going your way. And that's just part of the way it works. Either you made a mistake or just the market didn't like what you did or one of your choices for a little while. And as long as you understand what you own, it's very comforting. When this happened, I'll just tell you another story. In 86, our first 15 months in business, we were up 140%. And I called up everybody I knew. I called my siblings. I called my parents and said, hey, you got to get involved in this. And then in the next six months was that period in 86. And they were down 17% after six months. And I was ready to hang myself for getting them all in. And so it was a little bit of that at the end of 10 years that said, listen, I love this business, but it's very hard for outsiders to every couple of years lose 20 or 30% at some point along the process. And That took a toll on me, not a toll on them. They were very happy to be invested with me. And I said, I love this business too much to put so much pressure on. I'm I'm silly to not enjoy every minute. And I'm a big boy and I know what I own. So it's just more comfortable to me to uh, manage my own money and some family I'd made some money for and, and do that. And that's really how I came to that conclusion. So did you then continue running that same style of investing for a while with just your own money, like friends and family? 
Yeah, so my partner Rob joined me in 89, and so we ran our capital together and some a little bit family money, but it was no paying customers, let's say. We had done well enough to keep our staff and continue to manage our internal capital, and I, I did that for the next decade at least. I imagine you couldn't have possibly known what would transpire in active management broadly, in particular in the style of investing you were doing at the time. So did you ever have times during that decade that you said, well... We really had those one or two clients that made us feel perfectly fine. Let's just take that capital in to help pay for our analysts or whatever you want to do for working capital. Oh, well, I actually did that after five years. I had returned half our capital after five years in business and and did that for another five years. But I think the problem was really me. It really had nothing to do with my clients. It's I had very high standards. I felt bad when I'd lose money for other people and I didn't feel bad for myself because I thought... I'll learn from that. I'll move on. I understand what I own. I think it'll come back. I don't think it'll come back. So I either I'll learn from this or it'll come back and I can live with that fine. And I think just uh, the self-imposed pressure of managing other people's money in a, such a concentrated style, I have to add that, was difficult. I don't think that's a business model. I think that's a great investing model. I don't think that's really a viable business model, except for the longest term investors. So, and once again, it had nothing to do with having one or two good investors. It had to do with the investment manager, which was me, not enjoying putting pressure on myself. So what was the impetus for writing what became one of the greatest investment books with one of the most questionable investment titles relative to the quality of the book? Okay. Well, number one, you can be a stock market genius. And the original subtitle was, even if you're not too smart, was originally supposed to be... Any fool can be a stock market genius. But it turned out my editor, Simon Schuster, had the Motley Fools, and he wouldn't let me use the word fool. And not that it was a good title anyway, but it was slightly better than the one I ended up with. And he gave me 24 hours to change it. And my father came up with, you could be a stock market genius even if you're not too smart. And I laughed. Uh, Pretty much no one else did after I wrote it. And pretty much one of the worst titles of all time. Having said that, very proud of the book because I was sharing war stories. You know, I had learned from reading Buffett. I had learned from reading Graham, who were willing to share. I started teaching around then as well after I gave back the money at Columbia in 96. And so I always wanted to write and teach. It's something I enjoy. And so I had a ball writing that book. And it was very easy to write because it wrote itself. It was really just talking about war stories. What did I learn from that? What was I thinking at the time? I loved it also because it didn't involve doing a lot of research into theoretically, should I consider this or that? It was really, no, this is what I was thinking when we did this. And it was very honest in that way. I could have done more research to make myself look smarter after the case, but that's not what I was thinking when I made the investment. I thought it was more important to just share what I was actually thinking at the time. So I always had fun investing. I tried to share that in the book, yet share my thought process of how do you create a good risk reward? What are the lessons I learned from this? You mentioned mistakes. I think one of the first deals I did in the first two months I was in business broke. I wrote about Florida Cypress Gardens was being bought by Harcourt Brace. And it was just a little theme park where they had alligators in the swamps and water skiing Santa Clauses. And there was a merger deal where it was being bought out. And most of the attraction fell into a sinkhole right after the deal was announced and I was invested in it in my first few months. And I just wrote about that, the crazy things that can happen. So what did I learn from that? I guess you have to take those things that happen in stride. I can't really tell you what I learned, but it was a fun experience to live through. And I'd rather tell people about it than have them live through it. Yeah. So take me forward. We go another decade and you and Rob are managing your capital together. What was the impetus for what became the little book and then Gotham Asset Management? So I told you about the research that I had done in business school about Ben Graham's stock picking formula. And we had evolved pretty quickly into the Graham said, figure out what it's worth, pay a lot less, leave a large margin of safety, leave a big space between those two. And Buffett made that little twist that made him one of the richest people in the world. He said, if I can buy a good business cheap, even better. It was really just a minor twist, but it was major to us. And 
pretty quickly we realized that being involved in good businesses expands your margin of safety because you might buy in with some margin of safety, but the value of the business keeps going up. It expands your margin of safety. The value of the business is going down. It decreases your margin of safety. So we evolved more towards the way Buffett invests. What I had been teaching my students, what I had, Rob and I had been using to make money all these years, I wanted to test just like we did with Ben Graham's formula, that type of concept, good and cheap, not just cheap. And so we hired a programmer, maybe 2002, 2003, and we used a crude database. We used a crude metric for cheap, revolving around high returns on tangible capital businesses. And so we ranked companies based on how cheap they were, based on a crude metric of cheapness, how good they were based on this return on tangible capital, and just stuck our finger in the air and said, let's combine them 50-50 and use this crude database to rank them. And it turned out that the first decile, the best combination of cheap and good, beat the second decile, beat the third decile. And it's not like this is the very best thing you could do. We didn't spin the computer a thousand times. This was the very first test we did when we started. So it's not like I was trying to look good. And I thought it illustrated the point that even doing this crude methodology of sticking to good and cheap businesses worked really well. And the reason I wrote the little book is those examples were so simple. And the truth is, when I wrote You Can Be a Stock Market Genius, I had not started teaching at Columbia. And when I started teaching at Columbia, I realized I wrote that book at the level of an MBA. I did not write it for the regular person, even though I tried to make it fun and friendly. I really had assumed, because I'd been doing this so long, that people knew a lot more than they actually do. So I wanted to repair that. I also, at the time, had five kids. And I wanted to write it so that at least my oldest guy in sixth grade could try to keep him in mind when I was writing it so that I could really teach you these basic concepts. And so I thought I had actually failed with You Can Be a Stock Market Genius doing what I wanted to do, sharing it with the people who really need it. I don't really think we need a lot more hedge fund managers. And that's who ended up really enjoying You Can Be a Stock Market Genius. But I thought people needed to understand the basics behind uh, stock investing. And so that was the point of the little book that beats the market. This first experiment we did worked so well. I thought it illustrated good and cheap businesses. And I used that as a platform to write up those principles in, in the little book that beats the market. Rob and I used it for the following purpose. We said, boy, using a crude database and using crude metrics works really well. And I call that the not trying very hard method. We actually know how to try. What if we actually did the work? Stocks aren't pieces of paper that bounce around. They're ownership shares of businesses that we know how to value the business, like we're a private equity firm. We can take these principles and improve on them and be systematic about it. And we ended up continuing to do research. We ended up forming a big research team to do that research, a big tech team to run diversified long short portfolios that took advantage of this. And so we just sort of fell in and we did all this for ourselves. We didn't do this to create another business. I wasn't really interested in going back into the other people's money business again. But the result of our research was that we were better off running widely diversified portfolios and being right on average, especially when you go long short and take on leverage. You want to be right on average. You don't want aberrationally bad returns. So you couldn't have really concentrated portfolios on the long and short side. And we ran through the math of it, and it turned out you made more money when you go long, short, and put on leverage with more diversified portfolios than concentrated portfolios, because those bad periods end up in negative compounding, and negative compounding is bad for your long-term returns. So it's a fascinating discovery that more diversified portfolios, when you go long, short, and put on leverage, end up making more money and are a lot less volatile. So there was no trade-off. And that's how we fell into the other people's money business. It wasn't going to hurt our own returns by taking in outside money. That's how we fell into it. It sounds like, as you described it, this is almost an early version of what the word people are using now, quantum mental. And I'm wondering if you look at the two sides of that, the quant as it started with kind of return on invested capital is probably quant light compared to a quant shop. And the fundamental, I imagine, couldn't possibly have been as deep as what you were doing when you were running you know, six to eight names. So how did you approach both sides of that to create what you felt like was doing the work? Okay, so that's a great question. And I guess here's an easy way to look at it. There are quants and there are people who realize these things are ownership shares of businesses. 
and they don't think alike. They don't think alike at all. And what we wanted to do is say, we actually understand that we're owning a share of a business and that there's a true north a few years out, whether it's one, two, three years out, where I'm going on a little journey if I do a good job valuing this business that I make a promise to my students every year at Columbia. I taught there for 23 years. I promised each class that if they do good valuation work, the market will agree with that. I just never told them when. Could be two weeks, could be two or three years. But that's what I told them, that the market will eventually get it right. And that was our premise, that if we could do good valuation work, somewhere there's a true north out there, whether it's a couple, three years. That's a very different premise than a quant. The other difference is that there are certain factors that have worked traditionally, maybe not so recently, but for a value investor, low price book, low price sales investing. And I would argue that no private equity firm would buy a business because it's low price book or low price sales. They're looking at cash flows and how much they're going to grow and how secure those cash flows are, how certain they are of those cash flows. That's how they're really going about value of business. I would argue that traditionally low price book, low price sales had worked because if your company is selling close to the historic cost of its assets and you buy a bucket of companies selling that cheaply, you're bound to get more than your fair share of companies that are out of favor. So I would say buying a bucket of companies that are low price book, low price sales has tended to correlate with getting you more than your fair share of out of favor companies. The same thing with momentum, if I were quant. As if I were quant, I'd have to admit that over the last 30, 40 years, whether in this country and across the globe, with one or two exceptions, momentum has worked over the long term. But here's my argument. If it did not work for the next two years, it could be that it didn't work momentum because it's cyclically out of favor. It works over the long term. I just have to be patient. It's a long term phenomenon that works over the long term. Or I could argue that it didn't work over the next two years because the trade is now crowded. It's not so hard to figure out a stock used to be down here and now it's up here. And the returns have degraded and that's why it didn't work over the next two years. Two years from now, I wouldn't know the answer to that question. Is it cyclically out of favor momentum or has the trade degraded? So, well, I would argue that momentum has correlated with good returns in the past. I would argue that low price book, low price sales has correlated with good returns for 30, 40 years before the last dozen or so. And I think there might be good reasons for it, but also those are factors and they're discoverable and they might be degraded, I don't know. And all I care about is causation, not correlation, causation. And the only thing that's really causation is, hey, what are those cash flows? What are those normalized cash flows? And how much are they going to grow? It's an ownership share in a business. It certainly might not work for the next few years, actually valuing businesses like that. It might be out of favor. The market and I recognize the value I see, but I'm not going to stop doing what I'm doing because that's what stocks are fundamentally. So the fundamental difference between a quant who would look, I'd say, for correlations, and us, who would only look for causation when we put together portfolios, is fundamentally different. That doesn't mean we don't use, to balance our risk, quantitative measures of beta or volatility so that we keep, especially because you're going long, short, and putting on leverage, you want to balance your risk or that I... I want to make sure that I'm not buying value traps. So in fact, in what we do, we have high return on capital businesses, high return on tangible capital businesses, but we don't seek them out. It's We don't put in a input, say, I want high return on tangible capital business. It is an output. The returns on tangible capital on our long side are much higher than on the short side, but that's because we penalize companies that are bad at using capital. So it's more of an output than an input. So I just laid out a bunch of different things of the way we think versus a quant. And it depends on your label for whatever quantumental is. But I would say we're fundamental analysts as far as owning securities. We use quanti methods to balance our risks and put together diversified portfolios that don't blow up.
over time. And so we have uh, tech guys who are very sophisticated. You know, one guy won Google Code Jam, another one's MIT Chess Jam. And we need those guys to balance our portfolios, but they're not picking stocks. I pick those guys because they have no idea how to pick stocks. I don't want to know what they think about picking stocks. That's for our research team. And what's the research process been right in this all important task of valuing a business and trying to find cheap cash flows? The research process is really going over with a fine tooth comb each company, going through their balance sheets, income statements, cash flow statements, trying to understand what's driving their cash flows, what are real cash flows. Do they take a write off? What periods do they belong in, really? What is the true economics of this business? What are the normalized economics of this business, regardless of what's happening in the short term? And see if we can buy them cheap, taking into account the balance sheet, meaning how much debt do I have to take on because I just bought this whole business? Just logical things. I think the easiest way to think about it is we take the perspective of a private equity investor buying the whole business. And we balance our portfolios using other risk metrics. And then the size of the business and how much it trades, how much are we going to own of it? It's not like, oh, if the cheapest business is a small cap, it may not be our largest position, even though it's the cheapest. We'll buy as much as we can of it. And then we have to see what's on the short side that may keep us balanced in that. So it's a little more sophisticated. But we have long-only portfolios, too, that just buy the cheapest companies. And we have something that says, you know, in a bow to the move to indexing that just says, hey, look, people can't take much tracking error. So we're going to start with the S&P 500, which is most people's benchmark. And if we like something, we think it's cheap, we're overweighted a little. If we think it's expensive, we'll underweight it a little. So we'll minimize tracking error, but we'll add some alpha and I'm not saying that goes far from my roots of buying six or eight names and trying to make 50% a year. It does do that, but you also can't run $30 billion that way. And if you want to provide a service based on the way we value companies, that's the kind of things we're trying to do in a more systematic way. What have you found in the context of going back in and not only taking other people's money, but clearly a broader swath in terms of numbers of client base compared to what you did the first iteration? I like managing money, not raising money. And so when I got started, if a few people could fill the coffers of the fund, I was happy with that as long as we had an agreement. And I think that worked out well over time. On the other hand, we run mutual funds with thousands of investors. And there's something nice about that as well that you know, was, I think, the only people for the most part, that stay with us over the long term are people that I had a chance to talk to. And I'm usually talking to advisors who I can explain what we're doing, why we're doing it, and things of that nature, or institutions that can understand what we're doing over the long term and can understand what we're doing. And those turn out to be the best long-term investors for us. So there's something having a broad range of investors as well. You know, if you're not in the business of just accumulating assets, but Whoever I can talk to who likes the story and likes the, the premise of what we're doing and we can keep explaining this is what we're doing and they can understand that, those make good long-term investors. And I just like having partners and I don't care whoever I get a chance to talk to who likes what we're doing. I'm happy to have them as a partner long-term and most people actually are very sincere about it and try to be long-term investors. So I'm going to go out of order a little bit, but there are so many new ways that you've gone about gathering information and processing it. And one of them, when I guess it's in between these two, was the creation of the Value Investors Club. And would love to hear what that is for the people who don't know and then how it's evolved. Sure. So the Value Investors Club, it's valueinvestorsclub.com is the website. It was John Petrie, one of my business partners and I came up with this idea mostly in 1999. And at that time, the internet was relatively new. But what people were going for were millions of eyeballs was the expression that people were going for. And I always always was fascinated with the idea of an investment club where you share ideas with a group of people and you go back and forth. And then marrying that with the internet where people could meet anytime they wanted, where they could be anywhere on the globe. They don't have to be in your living room discussing the idea. I just thought that was a great thing. And at the time, the Yahoo message boards had stock boards talking about stocks, but 99% of them were worthless. Yet, we found on one of the Yahoo message boards, 
we, we had done research on a business that was similar to what I discussed. It was a very complicated capital structure. It was very hard to figure out. But once you figured it out, you were buying a business at a discount to its cash on its balance sheet with a really good business attached. So one of the best investments that we had seen in quite a long time, and we thought it wasn't a big cap, so we thought we were one of the only people on Wall Street to figure it out. And we found on a Yahoo message board of all places, someone else who had figured it out in all its complicated glory. And a light bulb went off and said, hey, you know, there's intelligent life out there. Wouldn't it be cool if we could put together just people who do good work? And to get into this investment club, you had to put in an investment idea that would have been one of the top two or three students in my class each year. There are some people who have submitted an investment idea, which is the way I ran the course, where you submit a few investment ideas during the course of the semester. And when you read someone's investment idea, you know, a light bulb goes off and says, this guy really gets it. And there were two or three people like that every year. So if we said, let's make it like Harvard or even harder, you submit an investment idea. And if you're one of those two or three people that would have gotten an A plus in my class, we'll let you in. It's free to be here. Your only obligation is to share at least two ideas a year with the rest of the group. And so we still to this day, I think there's probably about 500 investors. It's probably two or 3% of people who submit an idea get in. And it's very hard to get in. And then what's great about it is you post your idea. And then all these other smart people start beating you up. And with my students, I always say it's the best place to learn. And we have a delay on the site. So if you want to use it to learn, you can look at some of the older ideas over a period of many, many years and watch the conversations that go on about how good investors think about an idea. And I'm not saying every idea is good, but by the time you're done with it, you've really ferreted out the pros and cons. And it's just a great place to learn how smart investors think. And originally we thought of it as sort of something that would help us source ideas for ourselves, to be honest. And we'd share with everybody else, but it sort of turned into an American Idol for hedge fund managers, where we really discovered some really smart people that I've been able to put money with over time. I don't do that anymore, but when it first got started, that was an unintended consequence that we just met some super smart people that did really good work. And you can tell who does it for the love and, and just figuring out puzzles and who's doing it for the money. And we were always attracted to the guys who wanted to stay small and continue to do the process. So we found some really talented people that way. But there's always this question where you've gathered this incredible intellectual capital, and now it's about ideas, sourcing things, as you initially said, and then what do you do with it? And I know there was a period of time where you were backing managers. I'm curious, what did you learn from the experience of translating what you saw as great investment work to a successful investment business? So we did back a handful of these managers, maybe six or seven, into business and also to invest our own money with because they were doing very good work. I'm not wild about the idea of owning a piece of a business where it's very labor intensive. These are usually very small shops with one, two or three managers who are working really hard to get a, a good return. And so while it's very helpful to get them started in business and get them some of your capital, cover some of their expenses, take some of the risk off the table. And we've made some great friends doing it, but we stopped doing it after a while only because it's really a very labor intensive business. It's very individual business. And I'd rather the manager just collect the fruits of his labor rather than to continue to receive money that way. And I think our benefit has been investing our own money with those managers, discovering those managers. And so I enjoy doing that more. So have you continued to do that just outside of taking a stake? Here and there, I either have students or people that I've met through the Value Investors Club that I've given some money more to to be honest, more to help them out because I see talent and I'd like to nurture it, but we run most of our own money. So we're the wrong guys for that. You know, we think we're good, so I'd rather give it to ourselves, but we have found people who do closer to what we used to do, you know, six or eight ideas or 10 ideas or the bulk of their investment. And that's a little different than what we're doing. There's nothing wrong with that business. We'd be doing it too, but it's a full-time job. And so is doing what we're doing, covering a large group of companies is also a full-time job. So we chose to go along here. And part of it was, they're both great, in my mind, ways to invest. But I did the one way for quite a long time. And 
I like doing new and different things and trying to a new challenge. So we've been putting this team together and I love working with all these smart people who are trying to do a good job. So that's fun too. So was there a moment in time where you turned off that concentrated model and turned on the more diversified model that we've talked about? Not really. It was really an evolution. Once again, we came up with the diversified model really for ourselves. And we fell into the fact that we should be more diversified, not less diversified, which is counter to what our initial intuition was, because the alpha generation is very linear when you buy cheap to expensive. But when you go long short, put on leverage, once again, more diversity is better. Insurance companies don't insure five people. They're better off being right on average. And that's what we found. And so we started slowly taking an outside money and just sort of evolved. And then once you take out on a certain amount of outside money, I felt an obligation to spend all my time doing this. So I have most of my money doing this. And I have other managers doing the more concentrated. But people ask me, hey, do you not like that other way of investing? And no, the answer is no, I like it just as much as I always did. I can't do both. So I'm doing this now. And if I want to teach my kids how to invest, I teach them both. I think we can continue the tour through books you've written and we can talk about that. But there was the the big secret, which is the little secret in terms of distribution, I guess, of the four books you've written. And that was back in 2011. So what was the reason for writing that book at the time? The big secret was really a continuation of my goal. Uh, it was called The Big Secret for the Small Investor. And you heard me say it's still a big secret because no one read that one. And, you know, I always say that if it's true. But it was really a continuation of my goal for the little book. I think the little book, I was encouraged to write about the magic formula a little faster than I wanted. And I was building that up as a way to help people understand how to invest. And so the big secret was really a continuation to help people understand in a more global sense who are just beginning investing. A, what the advantage for a small investor was, but also why I thought that. And so it was really just a, they're sort of compliments. If I, what I tell someone who wants to teach their kid, I say, read the first five chapters of the little book, then read the first five chapters of the big secret. And that's one of the books I wanted to write. But the big secret, just so you don't have to buy the book, was the advantage of the small investor has is patience. There's much more data available. Time horizons are shrinking. They're not growing. I used to send out quarterly letters. Now, even the biggest institutions want to hear my returns every week. I don't know what they do with that information, but that's what they want to hear. You can check your stock price 30 times a second on the internet. And an endowment, even though they should have a, a perpetuity of a time horizon, there's a guy who allocates to US equities or real estate or whatever it is, and he's got a three-year benchmark. And I always say, no, they don't throw them out if he or she doesn't beat their benchmark, but they don't throw them a parade either. So there is a agency problem there as well. And so the big advantage an individual has is a longer time horizon to actually understand what they're doing and being able to wait out the short term ups and downs and not worry about outperformance or anything. And so really, if you take that towards what's happening to the investment industry with this move to indexing. I would say that's going to continue. I think the world will continue to get harder for active managers as far as a business is concerned. But if you're a stock picker, if you're an active manager and you're an individual stock picker, the world's getting better for you because less people are doing that work. And so it's strange that the active management business is threatened and it's going to continue to get more threatened. Yet for individual active managers, the opportunity set's growing. Because if patience or time arbitrage or however you want to describe it is the thing you're trying to take advantage of, that's a real advantage to have a longer horizon and less and less people have that luxury and it's going to be more and more of an advantage. So I'm very excited as a stock picker for the future for either my students or anyone who wants to learn the craft of investing. I think the opportunity set's really good. So before we turn to your most recent book, do you have any sense coming off of two very popular books, why The Big Secret didn't really sell? I think You Can Be a Stock Market Genius was unique at the time. I think the little book was fun and accessible and it did exactly what I wanted. The idea behind the little book was that it was little and you know, it wasn't some big security analysis investment tone, but it was digestible and easy. And I wrote it with a fun tone, which I tried with, you can be a stock market genius, but I just wrote it at the wrong level. So it hit all the marks and it has like a little formula that really illustrated the point. So I think that really hit. 
And I don't think The Big Secret had any of those. I did it to share with who wants to read it. And I love writing. I, For whatever reasons, I like writing. I don't think anyone else wants to listen to my jokes and they can't stop me when I'm writing. And I'm, I'm not really fleet of tongue unless I'm talking a little bit about investing, which I know something about. Otherwise, I'm pretty tongue tied. So when you have the chance to really think through every word that you're putting down, I really enjoy that process, just getting it right, just thinking that I'm getting it right and I'm expressing myself in a way that people can understand. So that's what I like about writing and I've enjoyed doing that. So I don't have a better explanation other than it didn't have one of those hooks that the other two did. So let's turn to the book that you've just put out. It's an investor's guide to some topics that are not necessarily investing, but of great importance. What's the perspective of what that means? Well, bottom line is politician will look at trying to solve some of these policy problems. It's called Common Sense, the Investor's Guide to Equality, Opportunity, and Growth. And so you're not thinking of an investor for those. Those are really policy issues about education and what should we do about living wages and immigration and banking reform, helping small businesses. And then our problem with retirement savings is more related to investing. But the whole background of it is that a politician or an economist looks at the world a certain way or an academician looks at the world a certain way. An investor, a long-term investor looks at the world a certain way. And if you look at solving a problem, what's the long-term payoff to doing something as opposed to the way politician may look at it. It's very, very different. And I thought I could bring that perspective. It doesn't mean I'm right. It means that it's a perspective that isn't usually used to try to solve these problems. And I tried to apply them to places like, most importantly, education, which is teach a man to fish, the ultimate long-term investment in someone. And the payoff is over the, the long term. And that was probably the most exciting chapter that I wrote about because I really think we can make a lot of progress there. And it's something I spent a lot of time and effort working on in my personal life to make a difference in. Yeah. So I know you spent a lot of time in in charter schools and Success Academy and others. What have you seen that works? So I appreciate the question. So here's the problem. If you live in a top urban center, top 50 urban center, and you are low income or uh, minority, your chance of graduating college are one out of 11. We know that college graduates earn 70% more than high school graduates and high school graduates earn 30% more than dropouts. So 10 out of 11 failure rate isn't very good for these kids. So now, if you look at the best charter schools, so it's Success Academy, which I've had the privilege to be involved with and help start. Eva Moskowitz runs it. We now have 20,000 kids. The vast majority, close to 90%, are minority low-income kids. They're only in New York City. And if you look at the 20,000 kids as a group on the math and English state test, they outperform the wealthiest suburbs. So they outperform the kids in Scarsdale. They outperform the kids in Great Neck. They'd be the number one district with this group of kids. Also, if you just look at the kids who are, unfortunately, they're currently homeless, they outperform the kids in Scarsdale. The kids with disabilities, the kids that are English language learners, they way outperform the kids who don't have disabilities and English language learners. So that brings up a problem. It says that the kids can do it with the right supports, the kids can do it. And of course, there are some advantages the charter schools have, but That's why I spend a lot of time comparing the kids with disabilities to the kids without disabilities and the kids who are currently homeless versus the wealthiest kids. And so we can see that there are a number of successful charters, not of all of them are successful, where these kids, the 10 out of 11 aren't graduating college, but it might not be that they certainly are capable of doing so if they can outperform the wealthiest districts. And I wrote about a district school. I wrote a, it's PS 172. He just retired, but there's a principal, Jack Spatola, who ran it for many, many years. It's in Brooklyn, in one of the poorest districts in Brooklyn and and one of the poorest in the States. So his stats were 99% of the kids passed his, the state math test and 94% passed the English test. But I just gave you the stats for the kids with disabilities at his schools. The kids in the district schools, less than 40% of similar kids passed the exam. So these kids with disabilities did more than twice as well better. The English language learners 
90% pass the English exam. In the district schools, it's 9% of English language learners pass the English exam, so 10 times better. So of course, one school has to have the best principal. So I'm not really saying that. I'm saying with the right supports, almost every kid can perform at high levels. And so in the book, I ask the question, what can we do with that? And because K through university education, we spend a trillion dollars a year. Very hard for philanthropy to make a dent on it. Charter schools are only 7% of all the public schools. And they're in the best places that have the best charters, New York, Massachusetts, California, they're very challenged. It's gonna be very hard to open even anymore. So it's not gonna end up being the overall solution. But what can we learn from the information that with the right supports, almost every kid can achieve at high levels. You have 10 over 11 aren't making it. What can we do about it? And I wrote about something I talked about with my kids at Columbia. I asked them when Tiger Woods was at the top of his game, I said, how do you beat Tiger Woods? And my answer was, don't play him in golf. And so how can we do an end run around the system that can help these 10 out of 11 who don't have the opportunity to get a high paying job from a college degree? And so I talked about in the second chapter of the book, which I'm very excited about, is something called alternative certification. And this is something that can be done now. So the example I would give you is, let's say Microsoft is hiring for its HR department or its accounting department. What I suggest in the book for alternative certification is that Microsoft state publicly what tests, what courses, what certificates can you get that we will consider in lieu of a college education and consider you if you've passed these or done well on these test courses or certificates, we'll consider you in lieu of a college degree for a high paying job in the HR department or the accounting department. It could be a simple literacy test, a math test, Imbolus, together with McKinsey, has designed game-based tests that supposedly determine how good your decision-making skills are and how good your critical thinking skills are. It doesn't have to be defined, just Microsoft doesn't have to give a test. It doesn't have to administer the test. It just has to state what test courses or certificates can you pass that we will consider in lieu of a college degree. It's very important. And then what I suggest is once there's a buyer and I go through what happens in Africa, where you have Clay Christensen, if you talk about how disruption happens in the business world, and you talk about how people have made a lot of money in Africa in dysfunctional economies, it all starts with a buyer. So if there is a buyer for someone passing this test or getting the certificate, then what I suggest is there will whole ecosystem of supportive resources online resources, tutoring resources that we'll develop to help people pass these tests. And they can be rated like Uber drivers and Airbnb rentals. And there's no government standards that have to be made. Just Microsoft, Google, Amazon have to state, what are these standards in lieu of a college degree that if you pass these tests or take these certificates, we will consider for a high paying job. You know, Google already has created six month certificates in a few technical areas that if you if you take them and do well in them, they'll consider you for a high paying job. But Google designed those tests. They're very technical areas. I'm saying a much broader thing and you don't have to design the test. You don't have to do anything. You just have to go out there, look at what tests have already out there, what certificates are already out there in accounting or anything that's related to HR or marketing or whatever it might be. And that's what they have to do. Just state what are our standards? And then the whole ecosystem develops. And I spend a lot of time in the book discussing how this could happen right away without government involvement, without funding. Communities can come together and help these resources. A lot of online resources will be free. A lot of tutoring services can be done with charity or communities or at much lower cost than what you get a college degree for right now. And so that's what I'm hoping will short circuit the current unfairness for those 10 out of 11. It's sort of a fascinating thesis, and I'm wondering, in the context of coming up with it and writing it down, did you have a chance to dive in and either talk to those companies or companies that might provide the testing services to figure out at all how that flywheel gets going? Well, that's a great way to put it, the flywheel. We have to get the flywheel going, and I think it comes with setting those standards. So one of the reasons I wrote the book was to help get the flywheel going. One of the reasons I'm talking to you today is to help get the idea out there to get the flywheel going. I invest a small amount of money in a computer test that tests your programming abilities. That's a very easy place to start. And we tested 20,000 people this this site and, you know, it tells you how you rank against an MIT grad. 
or the top 10% of MIT grads who took the same test. And, you know, it tries to get that out there. But that's a very technical test. And I go through the legalities, what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do in testing. Because if you give a test that one minority does worse than another group, that's literally illegal. So I talk around the end run around that system in the book. So it's totally doable, but you have to be very careful about that. And so they're already existing, some of these. It's getting started. Like I said, Google has certificate programs. IBM has some certificate programs. But that's the tip of the iceberg. And it doesn't have to be just with programming. It can be companies use data all the time in a very sophisticated ways. The Apple II computer, which cost $2,000 when it came out, ended up disrupting a $200,000 DEC mini computer. It didn't do it right away. It didn't do all the functions of the $200,000 computer that needed 10 engineers to run it. But the $2,000 computer that cost 1% of what the mini computer eventually iterated and got better and better and better. And then it took away all the business of the $200,000 mini computer. And that's what I think would happen with alternative certification, that these standards that were developed over time, companies would figure out what works well in lieu of this college degree what tests or courses or whatever you have to do, some of the tests that McKinsey's working on, you can just source them from anywhere and they'd have to iterate for a while. But eventually I think they'll be just as good. I show plenty of studies showing that really most of college is a signaling device to say that, hey, you passed through these hurdles and you jumped through these hoops and you made it there. And of course, these 10 out of 11 kids don't have that opportunity. So this is another hoop that's much more accessible for them to jump through. And what I would suggest is someone who was alternatively certified, who grew up in Scarsdale from a wealthy family who could have gone to college, you might ask if you're an employer, like, why did they do the natural route? Did they just do this as a short circuit? Where if you came from a background that was disadvantaged and yet you had the gumption and the ambition to study up for these exams, everyone who has not a great education may not be able to pass this test right away. So I suggest that there'll be prerequisite courses that you could take that will develop to get you ready to take the exam. And that, that'll that happen as the ecosystem develops. So I appreciate you asking the question, but this is kind of a new idea that I'm trying to get out there. It's starting in small ways. And if you look at Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan, he says, hey, college degree is not the be all and end all. We need to look for skills in other areas. So it's starting already. I just sort of set up a way that these big companies can make this happen right away. They set the standards. And what it really means is there needs to be a buyer at the end of the cycle of taking these courses or passing these tests. Once there's a buyer, everything else develops. That's worked everywhere. I show in Africa how a cell phone company where no one has money, there are no roads, there's no electricity, but yet the cell phone company turned into a $3 billion a year business because they figured out how people could pay 25 cents for a phone call. And that was better than walking three days to bring your crops to another village and find out the price wasn't right or that your mother's two villages over and you can talk to her for 25 cents rather than spend two days traveling. And so it explains how these things develop once there's a buyer. And that's the key. Well, Joel, I found the book stimulating and nodding my head a lot. So you talked about education. There's, there's stuff in there about funding retirement, capitalizing banks, immigration policy. So a huge fan of the book. And I want to touch on one other thing before we turn to a couple closing questions, which is, I'm just curious what happened. I know there was a time where you took the Value Investors Club concept and was applying it or trying to apply it to medical research. And I was curious what's happened with that since that started. Yeah. So we tried to have along the same lines as the Value Investor Club, almost set up identically where cancer researchers were actually posting their ideas their research on the site. And it turned out that it's a very technical field. Even if you're a cancer researcher in just a slightly removed field, it's very hard for them to understand at the proper level, the research, you know, it's not as universal as certain investing concepts. And so I think the flaw there was that it's gotten so technical, the research that's being done. And so deep in the weeds that it wasn't as accessible. And then perhaps if we had focused on people writing up their ideas for the layperson. It might have worked a little better, but I do think some of the subtleties are so subtle and so in the weeds and so inside baseball that I think 
That's why it didn't work out as well as we had hoped. We gave out a few prizes for very good research, but I think the idea didn't work. But they always say the things you regret are the things that you didn't try, not the things you tried that didn't work. And I've always taken that philosophy. So, and I enjoy trying new things. I'm kind of an entrepreneur. I like new ideas. And, and so I don't regret trying. And I think giving money to some good people was very helpful. But I think that's why it didn't take off. Like the Value Investors Club worked it very, very well. And I know that area very well. I think that's one of the areas. And, and in cancer research, I was a little bit not as well versed, although I did talk to enough cancer researchers that thought it had a good shot, but I think it ended up being too technical. Is there anything else either on the drawing board or in the back of your head of your next, call it entrepreneurial initiative? Well, right now I'm working on something called Invest5, which is for people to invest $5 a day. And it really comes from one of the chapters in the book about retirement savings that nine out of 10 people in the bottom quintile don't have any retirement savings. And if you earn 10 or $12 an hour, your social security is going to be something about $9,000 a year. But even in the middle, they have like $5,000. So there's really no savings. So what can you do for some of those people? And so it's called Invest5. And it's just a way to make it very systematic for people to start saving in something that I think makes sense for them tough to make money with people putting in $5 a day. On the other hand, I think it works all the way up the spectrum. I gave the example in the book and I actually taught a class of ninth graders from Harlem. And the first thing I put on their notebooks was an example of compounding, which said, look, start off at age 19, put in $2,000 a year for seven years until you're age 26 and never put in another dime, but invest that money at 10% a year. Or you start at age 26, and put in for 40 years, $2,000 a year and earn 10%. It turns out the person who started at 19, put in seven payments till age 26 and never put in another nickel, ended up earning more money than the person who started at age 26 and put in 40 payments till they were age 65. The one who put in seven pay payments ended up with $930,000. The one who put in 40 payments at 2000 ended up with less than $900,000. And the idea is starting early matters. But of course, when you're young, you don't earn a lot of money. So you can't really start early. And when you don't have a lot of money, you can't save a lot of money. So I talked about solving some of those. And Invest5 came out of sort of thinking that way. How can we help people be disciplined investors and dollar-weighted averaging so that they don't have to guess where the market's going up or down? And that was the idea behind that. So that's kind of a fun project that molds both my interest in investing and also help people save for their retirement. If you make it this far each week, you're probably ready for the closing questions. But wait, there's more. If you sign up for a premium membership, you can access our premium feed, which includes an additional set of closing questions each week and removes all the ads from the show, including this little pitch to subscribe. Hop onto the website to sign up. Thanks, and let's get on with it. Great. All right, Joel, I'm going to turn to some closing questions. As you know, there's going to be two sets. We'll start with for the whole audience, and then we'll save the big, big, big secret for the premium members. What is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? Probably my favorite hobby is sailing. I'm really terrible at it, but I love being out on the water when it's quiet, no engine, and I've always been drawn to the water, and that's just my favorite thing, taking a lunch out, going out for a sail, and so that's what I enjoy. What's your most important daily habit? One thing I religiously do is read the paper in the morning. I read a number of different ones with different perspectives on things. And I just like to know what's going on and stay relevant to what's going on in the world. And as disturbing as that is nowadays to see the divisiveness going on, I think that's part of where Common Sense, the book came out of. It's just some things that I thought maybe should enter into the conversation, which were logic and long-term thinking. I thought maybe that you don't see in the paper and you don't see in politics. I thought that might be helpful. So that's what I do every day to get started. I like to know what's going on. What's your biggest pet peeve? I think it comes from that. I think people have, especially with the internet, people have become much less open-minded. That's very hard to have a discussion about any new ideas because people have already decided and they have to be in one camp or another. I like having a discussion and I don't mind being wrong and I don't mind learning. So I love having discussions and it's very hard nowadays to have a discussion about almost any topic that people don't have a strong opinion and it's kind of pre-selected, not opening to discussing. And so it bothers me. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? 
I don't know if it comes from Jewish guilt or whatever, but I think it was beat into me that try to do the right thing, try to be the bigger person. That's sort of my go-to when I have any issue. I would say it's more aspirational than it might be what I try, but that's the first thing I think of. Let me let me try to do the right thing here. And like I said, everyone's far from perfect, including me, but that's something that I always seem to have in the back of my mind for whatever reason. All right. Last one in this set. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? I did the best I could, but I really think enjoy the journey. There's no there there. Enjoy every day. Try to take the best out of every moment. Learn from what you see, but enjoy the journey. I remember just one story that a friend of mine's daughter was a skater when she was very young. They were sitting in the theater behind Pat Riley, the great coach. And he went up to Pat Riley and said, hey, my daughter's, you know, whatever, seven-year-old skater. Any advice you could give to her? And he said, well, does she like to practice? Was the number one question. And I think, think about life as practice and just enjoy getting there and enjoy the journey. And I try to help my kids do that. And obviously, there's so many pressures day to day that people don't remember that. And so I need that lesson myself as much as possible. But I, I like to, as I get older, I want to enjoy every day more and more and more. And I, the earlier you learn that lesson, the better. Fantastic. Joel, thanks so, so much. It was really fun. Ted, my pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time.